Artificial intelligence harbors the dream and the promise of intelligent services in a wide range of industries and contexts. Medical diagnostics, self-driving vehicles, logistics and optimization, gameplay, conversational user interfaces in the home, and machine translation, to name just a few common application areas. The AI field has had its ups and downs for at least 70 years now, and we are currently in an all-time high when it comes to the availability of processing power, an abundance of data, mobile devices, and global reach. And this has affected business models and provided amazing technological development. But there is one crucial piece of this technological utopia that we need to address before we can create sustainable and meaningful value for customers. My name is Pontus Vanestol and I'm Director of Human-Centered AI at Inuse, part of AFRI. I have a PhD in Computational Linguistics with a focus on adaptive spoken dialogue systems. And I've worked for 20 years in the intersection of uh, digital service innovation and user experience design in a wide range of sectors. I've been at Inuse for four years now and have built the service design offering there. And I'm currently focusing on how human-centered design and AI can provide value for our customers. I also work part-time as a researcher and teacher as associate professor at Halmstad University in the field of service innovation and AI. So what do we mean by human-centered AI and why is that such a valuable perspective? Well, the key word is, of course, the human part of that phrase. AI has always been a very technology-heavy research field, ruled by engineers and researchers, and sometimes at the expense of a genuinely human-centered and experience-oriented approach. So first of all, as with all types of digitalization, we deploy technology just about everywhere today, and it affects humans whether, whether they want to use the technology or not. And AI in particular, changes the way people interact with technology. It's different from traditional digital tools. And I'll get back to that too. And third, AI-powered services affect workflows, data strategy, and even business models. So data-driven, two-sided market platforms open up new kinds of business opportunities. And this requires both UX design, service design, business design, data analytics, and AI technology. So our goal is to use these technologies to build complete services that empower humans, organizations, and society. And we do this by providing these enabling technologies for systems that see seamlessly fit in with complex social settings and dynamically adapt to changes in the environment. So how do we do this and what skills are required? So AI and hu human hybrid interaction is about augmenting humans not replacing them by automation. And this requires us to deeply understand human behavior, goals, needs, task and workflow analysis, and how intel intelligent AI agents can contribute to this situation. And our intuition on how AI should be used has often proved to be wrong. So Rodney Brooks, a famous AI researcher, has said, according to early AI research, Intelligence was best characterized as the things that highly educated male scientists found challenging, such as chess, symbolic integration, proving mathematical theorems, and solving complicated word algebra problems. The things that children of four or five years old could do effortlessly, such as visually distinguishing between a coffee cup and a chair, or walking around on two legs, or finding their way from their bedroom to the living room, were not thought of as activities requiring intelligence. And this leads us to one insight. The traditional, seemingly clear division between what humans can and should do versus what machines can and should do does not hold. And with all respect to Paul Fitz, who created the so-called Haba Maba lists, they turned out to be a bit oversimplified. So what's Haba Maba, you ask? Well, HABA stands for Humans Are Better At, and MABA stands for Machines Are Better At. So, for example, humans are supposedly good at inductive reasoning, they're great at improvising out-of-the-box solutions, or passing moral judgment. Machines, on the other hand, have perfect memory, 
and are supposedly good at avoiding psychological biases and they are good at Sherlock Holmes-like deductive reasoning. So these lists have been used to design automated systems for decades with subpar results. It's a very typical and rational way of dividing work. If a task fits the Haba list, give it to a human. If it's on the Maba list, it should be handled by an AI-powered machine. While this seems reasonable on the surface, it turns out to be deeply misleading and can lead to horrible user experiences and a negative impact on work. A better way to look at this is that machines are constrained in certain ways and need humans to help them, and vice versa. Humans are limited in other ways and can benefit from the superpowers that AI can bring them. This allows humans and machines to develop hybrid skills and workflows. So imagine air traffic control. We can't just trust an AI to do the day-to-day -day tracking on its own and just alert a human when something seems to go wrong. Instead, we still need to create tools for human monitoring, but use AI to manage the operator's attention and maybe quickly select from an AI-generated contingency plan if something goes poorly. Or in the case of generative design, we don't put an AI in charge of designing and building houses, but we can design a workflow where an AI generates a set of great suggestions of floor plans that a skilled architect can then curate and modify as part of a new way of working with the design of buildings and physical spaces. Because too much automation and work division actually de-skills people and making them even worse at handling these outlier problems that they, with Paul Fitt's Habamaba logic, are supposed to handle. Now service design is about connecting tools to workflows and skill sets and that means that we need to see human and AI agents as co-workers. It's about designing rich feedback and nurturing those skills that lie in the intersection between human and AI capabilities. It's also about designing for dynamic initiative. By this I mean that we're not first and foremost designing tools. We are designing butlers or working partners. An AI service acts on our behalf, and when it is working for us, it's mostly out of sight. And this is fundamentally different from other digital tools that we usually build. Tools that require a human user to put all her attention on the tool and the job she's supposed to perform with that tool. And sometimes the AI agent needs to initiate action, and sometimes it hands the initiative over to a human, and vice versa. So here my background in dialogue system research come in handy. Computational linguistics is about conversation analysis and how to model this in systems. And this mixed initiative interaction model rings true even in other kinds of interfaces, not only voice, but graphical UIs as well. But think about that for a minute. Here we're talking about agents that initiate actions on their own, acting according to our preferences, and this requires trust. How do we build trust and communicate the reasoning and status of an AI agent? What are good design patterns for conveying accuracy and confidence in an agent's output or predictions? How should an agent communicate what kind of data its predictions are based on? For example, here is a fictitious example from Google highlighting why a particular recommendation is being made based on the available data. To the left, you can see that the interface explains that there is no streetlight data available in this running recommendation app whereas in the right uh, on the right in the user interface the user gets no such information this is what keeps a human-centered ai designer up at night and this stuff is important critical actually because without designing for building trust humans will find their own workarounds and leave the ai service out of the equation so this <clears throat> ties into the field of explainable AI, and it turns out that it is super important that a system can convey its inner workings somehow, especially since data-driven systems are inherently different compared to humans in terms of how they see and learn about the world. If an image recognition software correctly identifies, let's say, a cat in a photo, humans have a tendency to think that the system somehow makes that identification in the same way that they would have done it. They might presuppose that the system now understands 
that there is a cat in the photo. But what we sometimes forget is that the system has no semantical or ontological clue whatsoever in regards to what a cat is or what a cat can do. So take a look at this example. Here's the smart lock service from Nest, where a camera with face recognition fails to identify the house owner. And why? Well, because it picks up the Batman cartoon face on the owner's t-shirt. The system obviously has no real understanding what is going on. And note how the interaction design in this case is handled. The question is put there for training purposes, so that the system can update who will get access to the house. So that's good, right? Well, sure. But I bet that at least some people would miss the fact that the question is in regard to the Batman face and not the larger image of the actual owner at the top. So by replying yes here, you have in effect given the key to your home to anybody wearing a Batman t-shirt. Okay, so these are issues related to the use and interaction aspects, not algorithm development per se. Another aspect to design for is connected to data and maintenance strategies. A machine learning system is dependent on data, and to harness the power of continuous learning and adaptivity in the long term, we need to design for data collection, and this is known as the virtuous cycle of AI. More data gives a better system, which attracts more users, who, if the system interaction is well designed, will provide more data, and so on, perpetually. And this affects how we design adaptive user interfaces. In other words, when a human solves a problem, an AI agent should be able to inspect and learn from this activity, designing interactions that provide such data without disturbing the human or affect the user experience negatively is vital. So as human-centered designers, my colleagues at Inuse and myself have the tools and skills to do qualitative user research, workflow and task analysis, and prototyping adaptive experiences to provide meaningful and valuable AI services. Together, AFree and Inuse have a complete toolbox at our disposal, state-of-the-art engineering and tech skills, as well as a human-centered experience and service innovation process and methodology. I'm convinced that we can connect our skills and resources to provide exceptional services that create value and positive Im impact on humans, organizations, and society. Thank you for your time and attention.